<laughs> okay, so I'm very happy still to be here. And um, for those of you who have been here yesterday, you might remember that I tried to make you a little bit aware about the mismatch of empirical studies and empirical data on the one side and feelings and emotions and public opinion on the other side. And we know that these feelings and opinions shape very much public attitude and also political decisions. So this is why we should ask about how come that people don't want to believe empirical data. Is it only because of miscommunication of the scientific community? Or is it maybe that elites do not know how to reach out to the normal people, which is now very much in the room? Or can it be also an effect of power control because the subalterns start to speak to, quote, Gayatri Spivak? So this is what I would like to uh, ask you and, and myself today. And I would like to continue a little bit with the mismatch game of yesterday by showing you some data on the integration processes, especially of the Muslim community in Germany. And then I would like to present you a kind of a new paradigmatic approach that we developed at our institute in Berlin on, in the light of the ongoing debates about migration. So uh, what we can see, and um, I mean, I just can talk about Europe in the moment, but uh, knowing a little bit about uh, the agenda of uh, Donald Trump, we can also observe, observe that the migration topic has also become very omnipresent here in the United States. Um, we all have reflected the United States in the past years as a country of immigration where this narrative of being a country of immigration even tended to be a funding myth. So the idea that there would never be a debate on immigration in this country was something that guided us within the last years of research. And now we look to the United States and see, no, this, what we were thinking about to be a normality in this country, somehow also is, being, is going to get under question. So um, I think to start off, we would all admit that Europe and now I can also say the United States seem to be in a crisis. And we had already had this feeling and its real manifestation uh, going to see in the opting out of the UK from the, United U from the European Union. Uh, in a lot of countries, that crisis that we perceive in, in Europe is predominantly framed around migration and also around increasing heterogeneity. I told you yesterday that this question whether Europe is going to be Europe any longer or whether Germany is going to be Germany any longer is a question that is posed uh, very frequently, uh, not only in public debates but also in a lot of newspapers, newspaper titles and so on. So the idea that because of migration these countries are going to lose their proper um, national identity is very, very dominant. Um, so the idea of migration is somehow connected to the idea of losing national identity. Um, hearing the experts' comments, we notice that also the Brexit has predominantly been argued by getting back control. And the idea of having lost control was not only because uh, the UK, because UK was part of the European Union, but mainly because all of the so-called Polish and European immigrants who came to invade um, the UK within the last years, in the public opinion. So what we can observe is that the migration topic somehow seems like a new ideological bipolar conflict that is alienating not only European countries, but the division lines are crossing whole neighborhoods and families. And the idea of a new bipolar conflict is something that we can reflect in looking at the new camps that are constructed. We can see pro-diversity, pro-plurality camps on one side and anti-diversity and anti-plurality camps on the other side. And these positions are mainly framed as pro- and anti-immigrant, especially pro- and anti-Muslim attitudes. So while migration becomes 
the central theme of societal debates, attitudes towards plurality, diversity, and difference become new markers of new peer group identities. We can observe new alliances that go beyond the established uh, cleavages that we know. They go beyond the established liberal conservative cleavages, and they even go beyond the established religious and anti-religious cleavages. And we can see that there are very ambivalent positionings concerning nationalism and migration. I was telling you yesterday a little bit about these ambivalences, and I would like to continue with some ground data on integration processes in Germany, because I want to lead you to my question whether we're talking about the right themes. And then I will continue with this paradigm. Um, up to um, the integration idea. Um, I know that we use different terminology than you do here in the US. So first, I would like to ask you what you understand by integration when you hear that word. Anyone wants to say something? Do you use the word integration in the United States? And what for? Not, not as much as like a generation ago or so. Like politically, it's not as, not as, not as present. So you, what did you say before that? Well, it used to be a topic, I think, mm -hmm. very much at the front of political conversation like a generation or two generations ago, having to do with housing and schools. OK, and did you substitute the word by another word? So are you mainly talking, maybe not. If I t ask, tell you the word, you know what I want to do. So uh, <laughs> just, is, is there anyone who wants to say yes? Well, there's assimilation. Assimilation and integration being two different topics mm -hmm. related. So, but when I hear integration, I think of school busing in Boston, uh, racial integration, also at the workplace. Mm -hmm. So um, mainly uh, the same thing that, I mean, what we can observe is that integration is mainly getting connected to migrants. And it's talking about minorities, integrating minorities. So the idea of integration is mainly something that has to do with an effort that minorities have to undertake in order to belong. This is how it is described in Germany. Integration is mainly a one-sided process of those who come and who try to get integrated into society. And the nexus between integration and migration is very dominant in German. You would never say about a German person that he or she should be integrated. So this is very, very much at the topic, integration is something that has to do with immigrants. But on the other side, it's very interesting because if you ask people what they mean by disintegration, they have no problems to answer what they mean. They tell you by disintegration, they mean that you have no access to the labor market, you have no access to educational system, you have no access to cultural, um, or, or, uh, to, uh, to cultural events, or you even don't have access to public transport, for example. And they also say that disintegration means that you don't have any access to the cultural narrative of the country. So there you can see, if you talk about disintegration, you don't have one special community in mind. But you know that this is a process where the state or the government or the society can do a change in order to get disintegrated people into those parts of society where they are not integrated in. But the word integration is totally connected to migrants. So this is also something that we can observe in the terminological approach of, let's say, Richard Alba, where he did a kind of a matrix to measure integration in society. And in Germany, this is mainly done by a sociologist called Hartmut Essay. And this matrix still is a matrix that we work with in social sciences, even though everyone is saying, this is so outdated, it's old school, and so on, but there is no such thing as a new development on this matrix. So if we, as social scientists, want to measure integration processes, we do it in these four fields. We measure structural, cultural, social, or emotional 
or identificatory um, integration. So by, by measuring structural integration, we look at labor market data, educational data, we also sometimes look at political participation, although we could say this could be part of field four. Uh, we look at language, we look at religious symbols, um, when we want to measure cultural integration, and for social integration, we ask for friendships, networks, mixed marriages, memberships, and so on. And uh, the last one, we look at patriotism towards the host society, for example. So you can also see that it is a very reduced level to understand about integration. I can tell you why, because it just imagine we can see that we have people who fulfill in all these four fields the highest numbers. They uh, have the best education, speak wonderful German, have German friends, and the last one is very difficult to, to measure, so maybe there has been no measurements, but a person like this that I described to you before was one of the guys who flew this plane into the World Trade Center. So in terms of measurements, he was fully integrated into the German society. There we have to see where this measurement of integration gets to its end to describe what real integration means. On the other side, we have families who don't speak a word, who do very low-skilled work, who only have friends that are from Turkish or Arabic communities, who have 10 children, but all their children are decent and wonderful people. So do we say that these parents are not integrated? These are debates that, of course, with quantitative research, we'll never get to answer them. But um, just, I just want to show you that how we try to measure this. In any case, having told you about the critique on this, uh, on this matrix, I still would like to use it and um, to use it by, because sometimes we use the same measurements um, like those people who try to use them in order to describe why integration of Muslim people does not work. I, I can tell you where, where our use of these constructs comes to a dead end. But I will start by uh, showing you a little bit integration data on the Muslim community because this community is very much contested as I showed you yesterday. And uh, the moment to describe where this community does not belong to the German society goes hand in hand with the idea that this community doesn't want to integrate into German society. I just showed you some data on anti-Muslim sentiments in Germany yesterday, describing you that 60% of the German society would say Islam does not fit into the Western world and it doesn't uh, um, go hand in hand with my personal ideas of society. So uh, ha having a short look at education data, I just quote again uh, Tilo Sarrazin, the former Bundesbank member who had a harsh debate about the integration of Muslim uh, communities in Germany. And uh, I already quoted him yesterday a few times, but I'd like to quote him again by, um, by pointing to his education, uh, educational uh, cynicism towards um, Muslim people. So I quote, worryingly the potential problems of Muslim migrants passed down, so to speak, to the second and third generations as the comparison of educational attainment shows. Here we can speak of inheritance. I told you yesterday already that afterwards he went on saying that this was because of their genetic predisposition, but I want to show you how a person like this with such a political power in society can say things like this even though they are totally contradicted by empirical data. So let's have a look at the first generation Turkish immigrants who came in the 1960s to Germany. We can see that less than 8%, 7.2% of them, when they came to Germany, they had um, educational, uh, I don't know how you compare Abitur and Fachabitur, maybe to high school in the United States. Can yeah. College uh, entrance possibility. Okay. So they had, uh, what, less than 8% of them had college entrance possibilities. If we have a look at the latest, later generations, so this was in 2010 when the book came out, we just had a look at the German microcensus and could see that at that time, 20 to 25 years old uh, people with a Turkish background achieved 22% 
of college entrance education. One year later, they, it, it was uh, even higher, it reached 25%. Then one year later, it reached nearly 29%. And the latest data that we have is about 30%. So we can see that the idea that there is no development within the generations is a empirical, is empirically not true. But still, there is this idea very, very much present in the German society. What we can see, and this is why I've highlighted it here, is that there is a big gap between the people with the Turkish background, migration background in Germany, and those with no migration background, let's say native Germans. So we can see that native Germans achieve higher educational entrance uh, education or college entrance education by more than 50%, whereas the Turkish population uh, only achieves it by 30%. So this is where we can put the finger on and say, why, why is there such a gap? But saying that there is no generational development is false and not true. What we also can observe is that the educational development is higher within the girls than within the boys. Um, their rate of achieving a mature uh, look at the gray line is kind of a linear uh, development, but as we can see that the men are having a kind of a stagnation. Um, this also contradicts the very much present idea in German societies that the, especially the Muslim girls are very oppressed and not allowed by their families to study, and um, especially not by their fathers and their brothers. So we can see is there they have constantly rising numbers concerning the um, educational data. Looking at the job market, what we can see there is that in fact uh, the population with the Turkish majority uh, background, so uh, you, you may ask why I'm talking about Muslims and presenting you Turkish data. Uh, this is because uh, religion is not uh, part of our microcensus. So people, I don't know whether you have religion in your microcensus here, but in Germany you are not asked about religion right? when, the, when you give in your census data. So uh, because the Turkish group um, until uh, last year was uh, the highest, um, proportionally the highest group with a Muslim religious belief, so it, they made up 75% of the Muslims living in Germany, we decided to look at this group because um, from the other groups we don't have any data. They are so small that we don't, can't, can't extract them from a microcensus. Um, okay, so what we can see concerning this population group is that uh, in fact their presence on the, on the labor market is very low. Um, they uh, achieve much higher social welfare and they are much less into higher positions in, um, in the labor market. But what we can also see is that, in fact, even though they, um, they uh, get out of school with the same data, these are um, experimental study, studies that my colleagues have done, uh, they uh, handed in um, educational uh, data from two different persons, one with a Turkish name and the other one with a German name, but in fact it was the same educational um, uh, Level. What? Level. Level. Not only level, but the same papers they reached in. Only that the names were um, were manipulated, and they could see that those with the Turkish background were really less invited to uh, job market uh, dialogues than the, than those with the German name. And uh, another uh, colleague of mine did the same thing with these figures. She handed in 1,500 um, applications, job applications, that were totally the same. The only thing that was variating and was manipulated in, in, in these um, applications was the photo of the girl. One time the girl's name had, she had a German name, Sandra Bauer, the second. She had a Turkish name, uh, calling herself Mariam Öztürk, and then she was Mariam Öztürk with a headscarf. And there you can see on these charts uh, that Mariam Öztürk with a head uh, with a headscarf, even though if she had the same ground data, was invited nearly 18 points less than 
Sandra Bauer, the same girl with the same educational uh, data, but um, having a German national bank. So um, in Germany, there is very much the awareness that it is a meritocratic system, where the only thing that counts is what you bring in and what you have, uh, what you can show as your effort in life. So this obviously contradicts the myth of Germany being a meritocratic society. Um, looking at cultural integration, what we can see also is, I quote again, Tilo Sarrazin, uh, I don't know why I give him so much place, but uh, he had a lot of place in, in the German debate. So um, I quote him, I don't have to recognize anyone who lives off the states, opposes the state, and constantly produces new little headscarf girls. Um, so so uh, imagine, I mean, I told you yesterday that um, he, uh, the book he sold was the um, best selling book after World War II. Uh, and this is why it's not possible to just ignore him, uh, because he has a high position in, in German society, being a social democrat and not being a right-wing populist. I mean, uh, this can be contested, but uh, anyhow, there were a lot of deba debates about, uh, about is he allowed to say that or isn't he allowed to say that. But while debating all these things, people didn't look into the real data on this, uh, showing that, in fact, if we now and look at, a sh at the share of headscarf wearing Muslim girls and women, we can see that the highest scores we have in the group age 66 and over. And I believe Tilo Zaratzin didn't mean this group by uh, pointing to uh, little headscarf girls. Uh, but um, what we do know, in fact, also is that 70% of the Muslim population in Germany does not wear the headscarf. And what we also can see is the, that the numbers are shrinking and going down from the first to the second generation. And this is also very interesting because if you go out and if you ask the public opinion, everyone will tell you that the numbers of headscarf are rising, rising and rising and rising. Although you have the data here. So this is why we have to ask how come that this is happening. Um, but what we also can see, and this is where I told you before, we come a little bit to a dead end by explaining, because by showing you these data, I somehow fall into the trap of Tilo Zarazin, because I'm telling you, look, it's only 70%, so it's not so bad. You know, the good ones are more than the bad ones. And this is where you just go, in fact, into this debate and don't know how to get yourself out. We have the same thing with school and swimming lessons. Um, we know that um, uh, people are, are measuring Muslim integration and always pointing out to that they don't send their children to school and swimming lessons. In fact, we can see, and these are all data that did, we didn't collect, they are from the German government. Um, so what we can see is that more than 95% of the Muslim parents send their children to um, sports and swimming lessons, even though in, the so in society people don't believe them if you show them these data. Same thing with language. We know about the language uh, skills of the first generation when they came, only 35% of uh, Turkish women could uh, speak well German after a few years and only 60% of men. And then if you look at the second and third generation, you can see a high rise. And this is uh, for 70% of, wi of uh, the women of, these gen of the second and third generation and 80, nearly 84% of young men. So, Again, the same thing, it's always the same game. Uh, I'm going to mm, make you a little bit tired with this because then you will totally assume that what is happening in Germany has it, around these debates is not a real debate about integration. This, we, I can show you something about membership associations. More than 50% of Muslims over 16 are members in a German association, only 4% are only members in an association linked to the country of their origin. 
again, same thing, but if you go and uh, uh, talk to people, they would say, well, they don't want to get integrated, they only mix within themselves, and they don't want to be part of the society. Uh, you know, neighbor, neighborhood context is also one thing that you measure when you want to know about social integration. And uh, we, uh, another colleague of mine had this study where he could see that more than 40% of Turkish youngsters said that they would find it pleasant to have German neighbors, and only 9% of German youngsters said that they would find it pleasant to have Turkish neighbors. Again, we have to ask where in this approach of integration is the problem. Um, last part, where it's about emotional connectivity and about seeing Germany as your home, we could see that 60% um, of uh, people you know, who describe themselves as Muslim would connect to their country of origin emotionally, and 70% would say Germany is their new home. Uh, this is something that we were working on when we were working on these hybrid identity studies because in Germany still there was very much this idea present that you can only be, I told you yesterday, a uh, slave of one master. So the idea was that in the moment that you don't assimilate and don't feel yourself totally and only part of German society, you tend to be illoyal and you cannot be trusted. And um, this idea of um, having to choose 100% identity is something that is still very much present, even though people now understand that this assimilation concept is not longer up to date when one third of the children has a so-called migration background. Uh, and that this either or uh, is, has to be um, somehow thought over and that there are much more identities in between. Um, okay, coming to, to this, um, this uh, um, is something that not, not only counts for national identity in Germany, but also for cultural and religious identity. And of course for gender identity, this is something where also people are totally um, thinking of just these binary identity forms. Okay, coming to the uh, second part. Um, this is what I wanted to show you before. Do we have to reflect on our measurements of identity first? So this is mainly a methodological question or a terminological question. And, um, but also, is it that we maybe have to think about the idea of integration as a new process that has to be widened out, that has to, be, that has to go beyond the idea that it's migrants that we are going to measure there? So maybe we need a kind of a post-migrant approach to uh, look at integration processes mainly as a whole of a society approach to see that there are of course people with no ethnic uh, minority background that also need to be addressed in terms of integration. Um, uh, people see that as very, very offensive when you say that or when you ask that. Uh, I tried that a few times, and it's always the same response that people give. They say, I am German, I don't need to get integrated. And um, then I, I do the same game, asking them about what they mean by disintegration, and whether they agree or not that there are big parts of the German society that are not integrated by means of disintegration. So they are not integrated into the labor market at all. For years and generations, they drop totally out of the um, educational system, or they are not integrated into cultural um, uh, aspects of society. Then they do agree, but still, they find it very offensive to be addressed with tools of integration. This makes it difficult for us as social scientists, because either we have to start and to, to think about a new term, that addresses the whole society, or, and this is um, what has happened within the last 10 years, there have been big movements from um, communities with migration background who said, we don't want this integration term any longer. Please don't address me with integration. And um, there was a big movement that called itself no integration, 
democracy instead. It was all these efforts to try to make the society understand that, there, that it cannot think any longer within this native and immigrant divide. When one third of your society has already a so-called migration background, or let's say the children, in reality it's 20%, within the children it's 33%, children under, under 18. Uh, so when, when it comes to these moments of total plurality and heterogeneity in societies, you cannot put up a cleavage like immigrant and non-immigrant any longer, because this crosses all your societal fields. Um, so coming to this terminology or to this idea of post-migration, and I already explained to you one idea that is getting beyond this migrant-native uh, divide and thinking beyond the construction of integration uh, and beyond the migration and integration nexus, I can say that this term post-migrant was initially introduced uh, by uh, the German artist Sherman Langhoff. She is now head of a um, very big uh, and famous theater in Berlin. The theater is called Maxim Gorky Theater. Within the last two years, uh, this theater was uh, twice awarded Best Theater of Germany. And um, she experimented with a new type of performance. And uh, um, she called her theater a post-migrant theater uh, because she wanted to um, reflect somehow social reality <coughs> in a different way by using this new tool to portray hybridity and second generation migrant culture in the art scene. Uh, of course, when she started, she had a lot of people, she opened the doors for a lot of actors and actresses with a migration background, and very soon she um, uh, was coded uh, with, uh, with this title that she's doing migrant theater in Germany. And then she came out and said, no, no, I'm not doing migrant theater, I'm doing post-migrant theater, because I am playing the same plays that your theaters have been playing during the past hundred years, only that I'm acting stories and ideas of people to that place that are living here for more than 60 years. And they are part of your national narrative, want it or if you, you can want it or not, but it is like it is. So she somehow found a new kind of language to describe these individuals. And uh, she said, that, I quote, in this context, the post-migrant concept refers to a chronological descriptive perspective. It starts with the moment of migration and continues with the description of the migrant subject from the first to the second to the third generation, end of quote. Um, so she had mainly an actor-focused perspective and um, to say, kind of, no, they, these people exist here beyond migration. Um, but what we can also see is that this term of post, the term of the post and post-migration describes kind of, um, can have three different approaches. The first one is what I already described, the chronological approach. What is happening after migration has taken place? Then the second approach is to ask, what is happening after migration has been politically considered as irreversible and is a, that just an effect of society? And the third approach is mainly a little bit, it can be described a little bit as normative. And uh, not only that, it describes the struggles that happen after migrants and other marginalized groups have entered the public sphere, claiming representation, participation, and equal rights in order to come be equal to the native population. So this is the main question I, I asked at the beginning. Is it really about them always being uh, somehow in the marginalized, marginalized position, not being integrated, don't speaking well the language, not being present in, in um, educational and, and welfare, uh, and educational system, but mainly in the welfare part of the society, or is it about them trying to struggle for equality, equality and becoming more visible? What we can see in these societies, and I want to describe a little bit the chronological uh, 
beyond in, in the post. But we can see that societies undergo structural transformations, social transformations, cultural transformation, and emotional transformations after having accepted that they are countries of immigration. Mm, this is something that is not comparable, I think, to the US because the US described itself as a country of immigration for quite a long time, whereas Germany is describing itself as a country of immigration only th since 2001. But still, describing itself or having accepted that Germany is a country of immigration in 2001 led to a lot of changes in uh, legal and political um, Govern, governmental decisions. Um, and we can see that the idea and uh, the acceptance that Germany, in fact, has become a pluralized society is very much present, even though we have still a lot of fights again. But we are talking about new narratives of belonging. We are talking about shifting and changing values and attitudes. And we are also seeing that empathy is shifting within peer groups. Uh, so what we try to do now is to somehow uh, push uh, new questions into the integration paradigm uh, and to make it, uh, as I said before, a whole of a society approach. So what we try to do at our institutes it is to have a different look on German institutions. We want to ask whether they are really integrated into how they describe new Germany at this moment. Do they have diversity in these institutions? Does the educational system approach the idea that being German does not have to do with having German ancestries, but has also to do with an achievement that you can undergo? Or is it that we can see that political inst uh, ministries and so on also have people within their uh, roles that are not only ethnic Germans. So this is that we turn the integration question the other way around. We uh, approach these institutions with this question, and that is what I told you. There is a lot of aggression towards that, but people somehow feel um, that they are under question. And they react. We can see that they react. We, are, we can ask for contacts. People somehow understand that even though they might have very open ideas and that they are somehow um, within, they are somehow very much aware of their liberality and open-mindedness, they can understand and know that they have no contacts at all. And that they know where if in the moment where the people with the so-called migration background or the children approach their neighborhoods, they don't know how they will react in that moment. So we are also asking about new national narratives, about uh, what does it mean to be German now in this society. Uh, and we also ask about trajectories of knowledge through history concerning minority issues and plurality. So these are all new questions that we are posing. We are doing that uh, in quantitative and qualitative ways. We, uh, I told you yesterday that we did a big population survey asking people these questions with a lot of irritations and uh, we published a few ideas that we could find within societies that were quite ambivalent. Mm, turning back to the idea of migration as a new bipolar conflict. So mm -hmm. I told you migration has become the central theme of societal debates. It has become omnipresent, and it's covering even major security and inequality debates in Europe, and becoming a trigger for increased racism and growing nationalism. So it seems that the migration issue is covering all existing problems. All problems of race, class, and gender that are interwoven in these comp uh, in, 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 in these migration um, omnipresence seem to disappear when it comes to migration. Ma everyone is only talking about this and tries to make the others, uh, the, the, the existing inequality, somehow invisible. Um, we, we can see that migration is, a set, uh, as I told you before, a central topic of national identity, but and this is why we are asking how come that where does this obsession with migration come from? 
And uh, I think what we can say is that migration is not only about people moving from one place to another. It is because that the, if it would be like this, it would only affect the first generation. But we can see that people are addressed under this migration bias, even though they have been born there and are people of third generation or have never migrated themselves in their lives, or even don't have to do with people who have migrated. Because let's say, for example, in our sample that we had in our qualitative studies, we had, uh, for example, a black person whose father was from Nigeria, and they, he met her, um, his mother uh, when they were in holidays. So the mother came back and was pregnant. The child has never immigrated and even doesn't know his father, but always is addressed under the question, when are you going back home to your country? So of course, this child has no other country than Germany and has never had one. But the idea that this has to do with migration is very present. And I think what we can say is that migration is a code for plurality. And uh, within these migration debates, all the other debates on gender, on, uh, on, um, on what we, we had large debates within the last year on, on the position of, of uh, equal positions of women and men, or we had debates about uh, uh, homosexual intermarriage marriages. We had these, but somehow they all get tapped by the migration uh, debate within the last year. So what we do have to ask is about the dynamics of this uh, migration idea. And uh, I would say that we can characterize the dynamics of these societies in five points. What I told you before, we can see, and this is mainly something that I can explain you by pointing to Germany. We can see that the first point within this dynamic mo mo moment where immigration or migration becomes centralized is the acknowledgement and recognition process. We see that societies transform after there has been this political acknowledgement of being a country of immigration. Uh, I told you that in 2001 that happened in Germany and what we can see is that after this political moment of recognition, the narratives of being countries of immigra immigration imply legitim uh, legitimate moment to... Oh, ah, let me say, try to explain, this is quite difficult. Okay, I try again. Uh, until the moment when Germany was denying completely that it has become a country of immigration, so let's say until 2001, First-generation immigrants always try to reach for equality, for political, symbolic, and juridical equality. This was a fight that was seen as legitimate, normat normatively, and morally. But it wasn't politically legitimate, because Germany was denying to be a country of immigration. And in this process of denial, these people were outside the society. They could claim for that, but they didn't have the political right to claim for that. After this acknowledgement and this recognition, uh, recognition and the description of being a country of immigration, you cannot deny people the same access because with this recognition there is a promise, the promise of equality, of equality within immigrants and non-immigrants. And what happens afterwards is a process of arrangements and negotiations negotiation of rights, participation, positions, representations, and belonging. So we could see afterwards that minority rights and positions have been negotiated more offensively, that there have been more uh, democratically legitimate recognitions, that um, the governmental, uh, how do you say, Gesetze? Laws. Ah, the laws that the laws have changed tremendously. I told you yesterday that in 2001 there has been a total change in the German um, civil law concerning uh, citizenship. It has changed in 2001. And what also has changed is um, the um, acceptance of a double passport and double identities. And what also has changed is the visa uh, laws. 
a lot of things have changed after this moment of recognition. And what also has happened is that privileges are questioned and equality representation and participation are claimed very harshly in society. What we also can see is that, uh, as a third point, there is a rising ambivalence and ambiguity, and I was trying to show you that yesterday with a few empirical data. So I described already that migration has developed into a kind of a meta-narrative that forms society and is omnipresent as a category of evaluation and ascription. Uh, simultaneously, we can see that perspectives are uh, that there are a rising perspective to try to get beyond these fault lines on migration, and we can see that these preserving discrimination leads to claims for identity politics. You have very special identity politics here in the United States. We don't have them at all in Germany. Um, I mean, they are rising now, but uh, we still, I think, should should uh, discuss about the topic, whether this is the real way or the best way to go. When I'm here, I'm always very surprised about how communities describe themselves and how close they describe. There is one community house for this group and the other community house for this group and then another one for this group. So everything is very much into these identity processes. And if you mm, think about uh, the deconstructive moment, you would say that uh, yes, with this identity politics, you can achieve more political power, but you always have people into these categories. And uh, so we can see that in Germany there is still this moment of resistance to be described as part of one certain community. The struggle for emancipation is mainly the struggle for getting equal and not forgetting rights because being part of a minority. But I think these both processes go or have to go hand in hand because there is one process to overcome the divide and there is the other one process to get more political power. And they contradict each other, but they fight for the same anti-racist move. Okay, the uh, fourth pillar of these uh, dynamic consolation in, in post-migrant societies is that we can observe new alliances. Um, this is quite interesting because we could see that very much in the movements against uh, the Pegida movement I told you yesterday. Uh, these patriotic Europeans against the uh, Islamization of, of the Occident. So this is a right-wing populist movement in Germany. And it was very interesting to observe that within these fights, um, we, we could see totally new alliances. Those people who were in the Pegida setting were not only as expected right-wing, uh, lower class, always neo-fascist groups, but also new conservatives, even liberals, who, who, who were coming out and getting out with new, um, with new anti-immigrant uh, attitudes. And on the other side, the No Pegida movement, we could also see completely new combinations of peoples. People coming out with signs putting Germany is colored, Germany is colorful, and we want it to be like this, were, also, were not only leftists and students or whatsoever, but a lot of people from conservative fractions. So we can see that this bipolarity this new fault line of being pro and anti-plural is dividing societies in between. Um, I think you could see that during the Trump uh, elections too, because people who would, whom you would never been imagining, like, I don't know, I heard 30% of Hispanics voted for Donald Trump, or even 30% of women, even though we knew that uh, Trump's position was not so much in favor of women's rights, but you could see that these camps somehow are reshuffling. What we can also see, and this leads me to the last part of, of these five points, is that while on the one side we can see these alliances and we can see all these moments of emancipative development, we can observe a harsher antagonism and polarization. Because 
it is also about the distribution of power resources when marginalized groups come into power and claim for equality. And we can see that this dualism of plurality advocates on the one side and plurality opponents dominates totally the political agenda. I, I, I try to sum it up uh, in this kind of a model. I described you before the bipolar structure of society where you have on the one side those who accept plurality as a given and as a part of the democratic composition of their country. And then on the other side you have that camp rejecting plurality as an, something abnormal, as a moment of time that has, been, has to, to be overcome in order to become um, clear and pure as society was before. So these two camps are dividing society. You can see in this, and the, the, the thing they are dealing with, negotiating the whole time, is the position of plural democracies. The, as I said before, the promise of plural democracy to every and each citizen of its country to be equal to the other. So this is a normative idea, a goal, an achievement, a promise that plural democracies shout out uh, into the civil society. They live because of this promise. Their idea of this promise is also developed by uh, within history and it addresses women and men equal, it addresses, I mean, in its idea and in its promise, it addresses immigrants and non-immigrants equal after it has recognized to be a country of immigration and it addresses uh, people with different uh, sexual orientation, with different national culture and so on equal. So this is what is at stake at this very moment. This is what is at stake and the whole dynamic is around holding this promise or getting away from this promise. So there you can see you have the alliances, I described them before, you have the antagonistic poles, and you have these moments of acknowledgement and recognition who are fought together with allies and who lead to new arrangements and negotiations who are fought back by these antagonistic poles. And this is the dynamic that would describe the moment that we can see and observe uh, since a few years, since 2001 in Germany. Okay, coming to the end, and to describe you this uh, paradigmatic idea about, about the post-migrant paradigm again, uh, we, we try to approach this idea in three ways. Empirically, um, we need to describe uh, how migration impacted societies work after immigration takes place. I showed you before how do cultural narratives change, how do institutions change, how do um, educational systems change, and so on. This is quite easy to ask for that empirical. We have the tools to, to understand that. Um, analytically, there is a need to deconstruct this dominant migration narrative and to depict underlying conflict. So this is the whole question to ask the whole time. Is it really about migration? Or are there conflicts that have been there before? Yesterday, I think you asked me about housing problems. And I told you we had housing, big housing problems in Germany even before uh, one uh, refugee entered German soil. So the idea is it's a quite big fight to get into these deconstructive positions to dismantle the idea that every problem that we have is because of immigration. But we have to dig deeper to understand and to make people see where these problems come from. And the normative approach would be a little bit uh, connecting to um, somehow social theory more on, on a moral and normative perspective is the idea to overcome this so-called migrant native divide. Okay, to sum up and to conclude, um, I said, I told you about the five A's, uh, the post-migrant societies, I told you can be characterized by five major elements. Um, the political and legal acknowledgement of being a country of immigration, and uh, this constitutes having a new narrative on 
being a country of immigration. Second, the process of arrangements, deals, and negotiations of rights, positions, representations, and so on for minority groups. Third, we can observe high ambivalences and ambiguities in societies. And these ambivalences also lead to identity politics on one side and the call for color brightness on the other side. So post-migrant societies, as I told you before, are characterized by the promise of equality clashing with social inequality and misrepresentations and hegemonic privileges. And thus, they are creating increased ambivalence and ambiguity in society. On the one side, we know that the normative approach of plural democracies is that of equal rights, I told you before. On the other side, the demand for these rights causes averseness and even aggressions. This is what we can observe at this very moment not only with immigrants, but also with women. You know, there is this big promise that in uh, Western societies, rights of women and men are equal. But then have a look at Germany, you can see that only 13% of the um, big uh, economic uh, industrial sector, only 13% of uh, them have hired women in higher positions, 31.3. Uh, and we know that the equal pay day in Germany is the 17th of March. So until 17th of March, every woman in Germany has worked for nothing. So this contradicts totally our idea and our belief system of ourselves, that we are a society where women and men's rights are equal to each other. But this moment of contradiction causes a moment of cognitive dissonance, so this is very hard to work with when you understand that your norm and your idea does not uh, match with the empirical reality. So then it gets quite easier to say, well, we have wonderful women's rights, but they, the Muslims, they don't have at all. So the idea to put the finger to the other instead of putting it to yourself is something which works quite well in, in um, social cognitive psychology. Okay, so what we could, can see is what I told you before, the moment to go and ask for this promise and for these rights causes high averseness and even aggression, and uh, we could analyze it, as I told you before, as a moment of cognitive dissonance. So the ambiguity that we can see, they result in either blatantly expressed anti-migration discourses or in somehow what we call discourses in disguise. Uh, what we can also see that this polarized structure is marked by alliances between those who share the same values on diversity regardless of their background. So this is also what we can now observe in Germany that people say um, I am in your camp because we share the same idea of where Germany has to go to in the future. I am not in the same camp with you because we are both Turkish, or because you are Turkish and I am Spanish, or because you are Turkish and I like Turkey. We are in this camp because we both have an idea of Germany as a society, and this is what makes us to work as allies. I'm not there because I am a good white person who puts yourself in front of you to hide you from aggressions and racism. No, we are both at the same way looking at the development of this country. So this is our camp. And on the other side, you can see a lot of immigrants uh, also being totally anti-plural. So what we do is we, we compare and observe that the ideas of Salaf, do you know what Salafi people, do you know what Salafism is? So. Um, very radical uh, ideas of Islam as a normative set that is not uh, pluralized. So we can observe that within this camp of anti-plurality people, you have the Salafi people as well as the right-wing nationalists. Because their idea, their reductive idea, their reduced idea of, of homogeneity is the same. The, the, the averseness, the fear that they have towards heterogeneity is the same. So they are in the other camp. And they are in the kind of antagonism and polarization camp. 
Okay, what did I say? Um, I said what we can observe is that uh, we, have, we are dealing with a kind of a normative paradox at this moment in Germany. I told you already yesterday, a very, very cognitive presence that we embrace diversity, that we are a country that has developed very far, that we know that we are a country of immigration, we like diversity, but we don't like Muslims, refugees, people of color, Roma, <laughs> and so on. So, you know, the moment is, if you have a norm or you have a norm. I mean, if you have a norm, you have to think what this norm means. It is the same thing to say, I am a Democrat. Quite easy to say, but very difficult to live and to, to live according to that norm. Uh, because if you understand what this means, and if you understand what plurality means and diversity means, you understand that being part of a religious minority means that this is part of this diversity construction. And you cannot pick people slightly out to say, I like diversity and I accept diversity because I love pizza. But, uh, you know, it's like this means uh, it is a very difficult concept, and people are not aware about how difficult this is. Um, what we can see is that there is a gap, what I said before already, between the cognitive acceptance of this moment and the emotional distance, and uh, this constantly causes backlashes. So people who, who think they are open to diversity and open to democracy and open for refugees, but suddenly they have refugee children in their schools, what happened last year, suddenly notice that their emotional lack to their cognitive idea is so big that they cannot bridge it, and that cause, uh, causes aggression in, in, in themselves. Um, what we also have, and we can observe that in Germany, but I'm sure you can observe that in the United States too, that there is a lack of knowledge concerning democratic principles. So um, people don't know about the amendments and the ideas that are in the German constitution. And um, they, they think they are acting according to the constitution uh, because they think they are born Democrats. And uh, if you are once born as a Democrat, you will die as a Democrat. But in fact, what we can see that there is really an erosion of democracy in European societies, where people effectively don't know. I showed you yesterday that people, for example, would say it is the right of minorities to make achievements and to claim for rights. But then if they really do claim for rights, like, for example, religious rights to uh, like circumcision or wearing a headscarf or building mosques, um, 60% would prohibit circumcision, 50% would prohibit the headscarf, and 40% the mosque. So there is the idea that there is something in the Constitution, but acting according to that is not part of the knowledge of democratic principle. And the last one is um, what I also showed you, that there is this omnipresent migration narrative that unvisibilizes underlying problems. Okay, to conclude, um, this is also what I tried to say yesterday. We have to somehow combine facts and narratives in order to bridge knowledge and emotion, I think. We have to learn that. I asked yesterday how can we transport the empirical data better than we do it at this moment. I would say what we need in Germany is something that we can call a joint, joint post-migrant integration contract. Uh, this is what I started with to say that integration must be seen as a whole of a society approach and as a democratic project. This can a little bit main, maybe um, go ahead with uh, Rousseau's idea of a contrat social, the idea that you as civil society make a contract with your government in order to achieve social goods and equality for the whole society. Uh, this is something we are exploring with in Germany with some politicians and some other NGO groups. And uh, what also is happening and has to do with the German um, idea, the, uh, uh, we think it would be good for societies to formulate a kind of an aspirative mission statement 
uh, rather than always be reconstructive. In Germany, we have this idea, I debated it quite a lot, the idea of German light culture, um, which said everyone who comes to this country has to adopt this light culture, um, but this guiding culture, to say, so to say. But uh, this idea uh, is, uh, was constructed very much on German history, very reconstructive, very much on how did we become what we are. And our idea is that Germany needs more, more something that looks into the future, that maybe never can be achieved, like look at France's fraternité, égalité, and uh, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, this is a promise. This is no empirical reality. But it is there to guide the society. And it is not over there, it has been someday, and we have to return to it in order to become good people. But it's over there. This is something that Canada also described for its society, like, like uh, um, plurality <coughs> and equality, and uh, how is the narrative of, of Canada? Multiculturalism. Yeah, but there is one uh, mission and statement. Unity diversity, is it? Unity and diversity, that's it. Like, you know, this is a, the idea that constitutes that society. And the German idea, the light motif and the light built Germany had within the last year is we are no country of immigration. That's it. And then multiculti is that. That was another light motif. So this is all very destructive for a society that is so much searching for its identity at the moment. And I think it would be a good job to go for an aspirative mission statement in this society that is so much plural and heterogeneous than it was before. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Naika. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Would, would you like to moderate or should I? You can, thank okay. you. Yes. I just have a question regarding like how has the German media helped to break down these barriers like a positive, give me like a positive example or have they always heard of the negative or it, sorry, I didn't understand. How have the German media contributed to breaking down these old narratives? I mean they you know the German media is very diverse. So um we have very conservative media, we have very um, liberal, we have very left media, and um, I would say uh, within this moment of the my, uh, refugee crisis, we could see a very interesting moment that you could not describe the media in the field that they have been before. You had very, very, very embracing approaches in the conservative media, uh, towards refugees, mainly argued by Christian motives. Um, and you had, for example, the churches being a big player in, in the refugee crisis with very, very um, um, powerful narratives. For example, the Catholic Church said, um, once in our history, we um, failed to put us on the side of religious minorities and minorities as a whole. And this is the moment in history that we can wash our name uh, from this guilt. Uh, and they meant that in the Nazi time, um, the um, churches, the German churches, um, collaborated somehow with the Hitler regime. And uh, for them, this moment was to just state that this time they would be clearly in their position to this idea of refuge. And um, this was a very conservative part, and this was very much in, in conservative media. But on the other side, you also had people like, which was really very irritating, for example, a, a very famous politician from the Green Party, uh, which is um, the very liberal, slightly leftist party movement, big party in Germany, he came out by saying things like, 
well, you know what, I have a friend who is a professor and he's very much afraid of his two blonde daughters because of the refugees to come to rape them. So yeah, this was also a debate that came from totally other side. You didn't expect a liberal uh, to put up such a position while the conservatives are putting themselves so much in embracing the refugees. This is what I was trying to describe, that in this moment there is a reshuffling of traditional camps. And this is also something that we cannot go ahead with our established cleavage the theories to describe how societies work. And we could see that in media too. I couldn't tell you that within these two years there was very clear positions of media. They were discussing it very broadly and widely. I wonder if I could intervene with a question. I already noticed in your lecture yesterday that you kept coming back to the issue of narratives and we need to find new narratives. I'm someone who comes from a literature department, so I deal with narratives and narrativity, and I also know Sharon Langhoff in her theater. I was even more surprised that you set her up today as someone who has found a way to address a new narrative. So I'm very interested that you, as a social scientist, are grasping at narratives, which is a literary mode, and theater, as a place where you think you can find answers. That, has that struck you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I was just saying that, uh, I already mentioned yesterday that I think that we are coming to a dead end with our established theories in social science. And uh, there was one a person yesterday who asked me the very interesting question whether we should approach um, n n neuro neuroscience. No. Neuroscience. Neuroscience. And uh, whether we should approach them in order to describe what is happening within these people. And I do really think that a lot of our established theories don't work. And um, it is not the first time that uh, out of cultural and out of theater um, theories uh, came into social sciences. Look at performance theories of Judith Butler. They also came out of the cultural field. And um, so I would say they, in the cultural sector and theater, experience something and experiment with something that they only feel but cannot describe. And what they felt hit ground. You know, they felt that society cannot be described the way it has been uh, described within the last 50 years in Germany. They looked at that and said, this idea to describe societies within immigrants and non-immigrants does not work any longer when you have second, third, fourth generation people who are totally hybrid and in between. And it doesn't work any longer to describe your national narrative without these people because they are part of your day-to-day -day and everyday life. But they don't have part in the historical idea of how Germany is, how Germany became what it, what, is it, what it is now, how it has developed into what we now call New Germany. So within these ideas, there is no part. And we took that up at the study that I was mentioning. We asked people to describe um, histo their historical view of Germany. This was quite difficult to make that up because it was a quantitative approach, but we asked them, the people for an open question. So we had to code afterwards more than 8,000 answers. And, uh, but what we could see and what really was irritating uh, or, and, but, and contradictory to what people say in Germany is that the main historical vision or view of themselves was the reunification process. Uh, very, very high. And the idea of the Second World War ranked, I don't know where, but it was like less than, I think, 18% who said the Second World War is the major historical uh, event that I would describe to describe Germany. But when you go into society, all people, Germans, would say Germany has to deal with a negative identity. It only describes itself via the Second World War and Holocaust. So we could empirically prove that this is not true. 
that Germany, in fact, is developing into a kind of a positive self-narrative of itself that can also be um, dangerous. It can, but we have to observe it. In fact, there is this moment of truth is that this idea that Germany is only constantly describing itself negative is a narrative. It's not an empirical fact. So we know about the power of narratives, and I can tell you how powerful narratives are. For example, by describing you the narrative change of Germany is a country of immigration, in uh, contradiction to Germany is not a country of immigration. You know, when this commission decided to describe Germany as a country of immigration, during that time, that was in 2001, Germany had something slight about 14, uh, 14 million people with a so-called migration background. Back in the 70s, Germany already had 14 million people with a migration background. So this shift was not an empirical shift, and it wasn't due to the fact that there were more immigrants than before. The number of immigrants had not changed. The only thing that had changed was this powerful narrative to now describe itself as a country of immigration. And this narrative led to a lot of new laws. Uh, in, in fact, no empirical change. Other thing, imagine already 200 years ago, the societies were composed by 50% women and 50% men. And women had no political rights. They had no juridical rights, even some were, they didn't have any symbolic rights. Then there was this powerful women's movement and the idea that women and men had to go for, for the same rights. There was no shift in the empirical numbers of women but that brought societies to think about it. It was a big deal and a big fight for that. But after there has been that fight, it became illegitimate to see women in lower grades or to see them with other laws than others. This is what I was describing before. The moment of political acknowledgement leads to a moment of legitimation that allows women to fight for their rights because they can claim for them. This is what we said also by this acknowledgement of being a country of immigration. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, so you talked about this uh, cognitive emotional disconnect and people um, cognitively saying that they're open-minded but reacting very negatively emotionally um, to, for example, immigrants in their neighborhoods or refugees in their neighborhoods. And I'm wondering because there's um, this theory in immigration studies um, that, you know, supposedly sometimes tolerance um, can be built through exposure. So if you know more immigrants or um, minorities, you might be more tolerant to them and see them more as people. And I'm wondering if um, you see if um, that idea um, is still relevant in the face of this, you know, cognitive emotional divide that we have. Yeah, actually, I was um, thinking about that yesterday. Because you know this um, uh, intergroup social contact theory of Alport that you're mentioning, uh, that we describe as contact hypothesis, is uh, something that, as to my view, also is coming to a dead end. It doesn't work so well because um, you know on the one side you, we have to ask ourselves what are we going to do with that information. The more contact you have, the more possibilities you have to get away with your stereotypes. But what do you do in societies where you, there is no possibility of contact? Will you say, okay, they remain racist for the whole rest of their lives. We can't do anything about it because there is no contact. So this would be quite pessimistic to look at that. But on the other side, we can also see that also in places where there is a lot of contact, um, racism and distance remains. So. This is why I am not so happy with that, um, with that approach. Um, I, I think it can work, but it also cannot work. So this is not so uh, well to work with empirically if you have such a weak um, construct to base on. 
Okay, well, I think we have to uh, end now, but if you have further questions, let me remind you there is an open seminar tomorrow that will begin at 12.20 over in the Social Science Building, and then we can take up all these questions and fight them out further. So thank you once thank again. You very much. Thank you.